We are back. Welcome to the Leadership Launchpad Project. I'm Rob Kalvaroski, and as always, the Yang to my yin is here. Susan Hobson. Susan, how are you? I am feeling especially calm this morning, believe it or not. I know I usually get on the mic and say, let's get this party started, but I just had the most incredible IFS session myself yesterday, and I woke up feeling better than I have in weeks. So yeah, I'm feeling calm for a change. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh it's it's good news for the listeners. Um, I don't know, I guess I have to play the part of high energy guy then. <laughs> you gotta be the yang to my yin today, buddy. Let's go. <laughs> so as always, we gotta start off with a quote. And I have one here from Damon John. Ooh. And he says, if people haven't laughed at your dreams, then you aren't dreaming big enough. Just keep pushing forward. Oh my gosh. I love that on so many different levels. Tell me what resonates for you, sir. Yeah, it's it's something that's been coming up with a lot of my clients recently is this element of, of they're making decisions from self and they're being reflected that the folks around them are judging them for these decisions. And so I had one client who he turned down this job offer that was worth a fair amount of money, but he was like, you know, it's not for me. And he was like, I don't tell most people, like he tells his wife and a close friend, but he's like, you know what? Like, I don't want to tell folks because I want, I, they won't understand. Oh yeah. I get that a lot too. Yeah. And so for folks out there, like, this is part of you becoming a self-led leader is making decisions in accordance to you that maybe other folks don't quite understand because they're still driven by, you know, being the best, being achiever, making money, having the Ferrari, all these things, right? Mm -hmm. And so the power of the work is being clear on your decisions and then ultimately finding that fulfillment and happiness within yourself. And one thing I want to add to that is this miraculous thing starts to happen, right? When you get past the fear of sharing those big audacious dreams out in the world is you start to attract people who are big thinkers like you are. Don't you find? (laughs) You start to call those people in, right? They start to show up in different spaces and places in your life. And yeah, that's the one thing I do want to say. It's like, maybe lonely at first when you start to put that out into your world in terms of the people that you are associating with. But uh, I think that's a step in terms of calling the right support systems in place, the right like-minded individuals into your corner. Absolutely. And so we have a special guest with us today, Meta Keating, the founder and creative director at Metaspace, and another person who has some incredibly big goals. Oh, yeah. Yeah. How are you and what do you think of the quote? I actually really love the quote. And thank you for having me on here. I'm I'm so thrilled. I'm calling in from Copenhagen. This is sort of my my um where I originated. Um but what I really like about your quote is it's just about being true to yourself. And it doesn't need to be big or small, but you just have to be true to yourself. And in Denmark, we have this law called Jensen law that I would love to speak more about. But what it really does, it's exactly s- stepping out of your hurt, which is a really hard thing to do. And if there's any Danish people on, on this call, they would know because it's it's a super, super comfortable place to be. But if you want to reach out, we have this unwritten law that we all kind of are fed up with when when are fed with when we are kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, as we're growing up. So being true to yourself um, is hugely important for your happiness. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And tell yeah. us about that self, Meta. <laughs> Plug our people in to your incredibleness. Meta has been a client of mine for the last a little bit over a year now, right, Meta? Uh, we've yeah. been knee deep in that self-leadership work. But tell our people a little bit about yourself and the 2.0 mission that you're on as a human-centric leader. Yeah, it's been, <laughs> it's been a, a very big journey, especially the last year where I've realized that I actually 
have ambition to be bigger than I am comfortable maybe being in. And that means that I had to push some boundaries of my own with your help. Um, but my mission is, is to actually bring my knowledge about physical space into uh, the C-suites um, and actually having people create work environments that are healthy and productive and people want to be in. So from just doing one-off projects, like one by one by one, I've actually over also the pandemic and with the work from users and I've learned about my own, my, my own internal family systems, I've been able to listen to myself and also getting past some of my part, not past, but listening to some of my parts. So that has been a huge part. So I'm on a huge mission to um, actually be, you live up to my full potential. Yes. And you're yep. trying to change the way this game's being played through human centric design. Yeah. You want the game tape for our audience a little bit and just help us plug into what really first inspired you or called you to that mission in the first place. Yeah, I was on the treadmill myself for years, having kids, and but I worked in a super exciting job uh, in a conference center for like a Scandinavian conference center for years, and I loved the job. And what I uh, what I did as part of my job was in AutoCAD, like a, a drawing program, I would arrange all kinds of events. And I noticed, and I've always been interested in design. The design just like. Uh, and like in Denmark, it's like design is a big thing, just nice, mm -hmm. beautiful things. But what I noticed was like the impact on on the flow of these spaces that I was creating. If it was a good event or bad, not bad event, and how much like color had to do with the elements that I was bringing. But I was just doing it intuitively, like this works, this doesn't work, and I could see the impact on what was going on without knowing what I was what I was doing. Right. Um, but I actually, I, I moved on from that job into a coaching firm. And in that coaching firm, I, I learned all the tools about asking the right questions and, and making people being heard and listening. And then I was, as I was doing that, I was like, this is pretty interesting. Like, I would love to, how can I help these people with, through their environment to get better easily or, or thrive more in their lives? And so then I went actually back to school and did a sort of an intense interior design, but more like human centered design uh, approach. And that kind of blew my mind because it was a lot more about what I was intuitively doing, but actually knowing this is why and this is how. And I, with all those tools that I had, I created my first company in Denmark. Um, so that is like, I don't know, 18 years ago. And um, then we moved to Canada and I have done a lot of institutions, homes and uh, like schools, but I thought, okay, where can I have the biggest impact? Where do people spend a lot of their time? And that is in the workspace. So that is my mission is actually making people happy at work. It's the core of why I'm doing what I'm doing. Yeah. So that's the short story. <laughs> <laughs> it's so amazing and it's funny right like a lot of the folks are or a lot of the companies are calling people back to the office and my my favorite meme going around right now is it's it's like um bringing people back to the office with high corporate culture and it's just a picture of like the 1990s cubicles like the drab <laughs> i know I know. So yeah. So what I want, yeah, what I want to say, like what I'm seeing has happened. I am so thrilled with what's like, I wasn't thrilled about the pandemic, obviously, but what it has opened up is now it's not just the early adapters, like the tech industry that I've done a lot of uh, projects for that already knew, okay, it's, we need, we need to attract talent we need to keep talent. We need to make them productive when they're at work. Um, we need to like use all the, like the productivity would go up by creating cool and exciting environments and healthy. Um, but now it's, it's becoming sort of more of a, of a mainstream, like certainly more companies are waking up and, and trying to get people back to work. And it's just a huge opportunity for these companies to actually tap into this 
unattended, like on this un this tool that most companies are not even thinking about that they actually could tap into. Tell us more about that in terms of how something like consciously creating your work environment can actually help you attract, retain, and even optimize your talent. Where's the connection yeah. between the two? Oh my God, where do I start? <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's huge. It starts, it starts, um, I mean, what I, what, what, when you do this, it's not just impacting the employees, it, it's impacting the leaders as well. Like, so, so it's a, it's a total win, 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 win. But what happens is even, it's actually a lot of it happens on your subconscious level. It's in your nervous system uh, that you can actually uh, make people feel at ease and not stressed. Um, it's it's the message you get when you're walking in the doors. It's the type of lighting you're using, the materials you, you've chosen to put in there. And we know how we feel in nature, for example. So this is one of the things I... I, when I try to talk to people about what's happening, it's like if a plant can't survive in your space, neither can people. Oh. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> but it needs nurture. So it needs light. It needs proper light. LED, like there's a lot of lights, bad, bad lights, even bad LED lights. But it's the experience that those lights, um, like when when you don't have natural light and you need to kind of have artificial lights, it's what light source is that. How does that, how does that lit up the rooms or the colors you have in the room? Uh, think about like a gallery that would never have, for instance, light in the in the space because you wouldn't see the true color of the gallery. Mm -hmm. So it's that whole feeling you get when you come in. Are you welcome? Do you do we appreciate you? Do we value you? And and it doesn't have to be like all. Um, sort of totally soft because we also want an environment to be productive. We want brainstorming, but it's the it's the message you're kind of giving um, to anybody entering your space, including yourself, that you want to come back. I like to create spaces that you want to come back to. Do it's so any, powerful. Do you have any principles you could share? Like, obviously, the lighting is super important, but do you have any principles you could share with our leaders out there? about like how they should look at their current space and just notice if there's any improvements they could make. It's usually always improvements to be made. Like it's um, like you should ask yourself, do I want to come back to this place? Uh, and is it, is it <laughs> because often it, it's, it's about like, like you, there's not a words like trust. Do I feel comfort when I'm in this space? Or am I super tired at the end of the day? Um, so it's really kind of feeling, but there's not one fits all. Like it's, it's, I think I would start with why do you have an office today? We can, we actually start asking, why do you even have an office? Mm, that's because so good. a lot of businesses don't need an office. Mm. So if you have an office, what does it do for your business or for your, the staff and for yourself? Mm. What does it do for you? And if, if you need to have an office, how do you get people to come back in for the right reasons, um, depending on what you want them to do in the office? So it, it's like a lot of analysis of, of the needs and the purpose that you need to do before you actually create a space. Um, so it has a lot to do with the materials you're using, the how you're setting it up. Like, is it? Is, is any natural materials in there, like a wood floor? or And it doesn't actually, so the evidence now show, and there's going to be a lot of this in, in my upcoming book as well, actually hardcore evidence that I know North American loves to have of, um, of um, what an impact it has. But like, because how do you, how do you measure um, productivity, like sort of, or, or how you feel in the space? I used to do my own studies, like some before and after, and I can say going up around 21% by changing the environments mm -hmm. into something more suitable. But now there's there's far more evidence and it's just becoming much more of a, of a like people are getting it more now that it is actually an important thing because they can see the difference over the pandemic where they were and how well they were productive or not. Yeah. Love that. 
You, you mentioned trust. Let's get real specific now and start drilling down into some of these human being needs. I mean, this is what makes it a human centric design, right? Concept is that you're paying attention to the needs of the human beings. And we do that, right? Because the hierarchy of needs, Maslow's hierarchy of needs says that when our human being needs are met, it's actually a performance driving strategy. Who would have thunk it? But you mentioned trust. And I feel yeah. like that's a lot of why leaders, I know the leaders I'm working with are trying to get their people back to the office, right? Because they just have a really hard time instilling trust remotely and having that trust amongst teammates, right? So that they actually can be highly collaborative, creative, innovative. So how can we start to rethink our work environments for the purpose yeah. of building trust? Yeah, so like so in in my world, the hierarchy is like at the bottom. We have like the basic. We have the walls. We have the desks. We have the chairs. And and as you move up, um, is if you want to attract the right the people that actually want to be there and they get engaged, you get up sort of to the higher level um, of, and not just it's so that's where you 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 hit more people with. Um, like uh, listening to the people, even bringing someone like me in um, to look at your environment means, oh my God, you want me to be here. Like I'm valued as as, a, as a, an employee mm -hmm. uh, by even giving people proper chairs to sit in. And uh, Rob, I heard one of you, like they didn't even have toilet paper. Like it's, you need to value people <laughs> on, the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the human level, meeting them human yeah. to human. It doesn't mean that you can't be a leader to, to employees because you need leadership, mm -hmm. but it has a lot to do. Like, so if you want people to be collaborative, you need to make sure that there's places that they can collaborate. Mm. Um, I've done, I've done places where, uh, like the eating together, lunches together was sort of an afterthought. It's like people just eat at their desks. So if you want people to actually connect, this happens a lot. <laughs> trust mm, me. I'm not surprised. Um, like I just go get my lunch and then I sit at my desk. Yeah. So if you want people to actually create that community and uh, culture, you need to create places that where we are human together. And human together is like basic is actually eating together. A and meal. having events together yeah. and, and connection. So you need to create these spaces where people gather naturally too. Mm. So that's a, like we, call, we used to call it the kitchen party when we were doing that. Not that there had to be a party all the time, but it's, it's just a place to gather and meet at all the levels of, of employment together and meet. And that's why we have the word hygge, that it, like I know most people know it from homes. But I've actually used that also when I do my designs in, in corporate spaces. Because when we have hygge, which is like a, where your nervous system is, just like you can't have hygge and stress at the same time. It just doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So if you want to have hygge in, a, in an environment, people are also doing it one where you have like soft seatings and warmer colors that I see designers actually starting to bring into space, which is fantastic. But it also, it's just sh shuts down that stress level in us and we feel welcome and needed and wanted to be. And the flip side of this is you engage. And it's, it's not even like, I'm not even uh, doubtful that it, the, it's the, it's an investment. It's not an expense to do this. Like it, it comes back because people want to come to work yeah, and collaborate. I can tell you're feeling the hygge over there with the candles in your window. I, I put right them in now. because it is December. So I thought, yeah. okay, I can get away with this today. Yeah. But I've actually done it. I'm working on a Swedish company that is in, in Toronto right now. And they actually in their kitchen as has candles uh, just for, for a special events, not maybe all the time, but they, it's, it's, the, the candle is a gathering point. It's, it's also, it can also just be light, but you gather instead of just having the fluorescent overlight that you see in a lot of places there's no definition so we use light a lot colors art materials is um and the flow plants, of space the plants plants you too plants yep. flowers yeah, but evidence yeah, evidence is actually showing it can also just be pictures of landscapes or um or birds yeah 
Rob's got a, or birds. <laughs> Rob's got a picture of a bird behind him. This is the whole yeah. method to his madness in terms of why he left Edmonton for Costa Rica. We hear the sanctuary of birds behind him on our Zoom calls now, and it's given all of us hugga over here. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> and I was just gonna, I was just gonna say the balance. So it's about balance and the yin and the yang. So you are the energy today, uh, Rob, with your red shirt. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's 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 all about. It's really about balance in spaces. But a lot of people don't know what to, what what what's missing. So you feel it, but you don't know what's wrong here. Um, and and decluttering obviously is also something that is like just basic. Mm -hmm. um, but I would if if you were uh, giving a tip to to someone is is try to walk into your office as it's the first time you walk in there. Try to actually notice. Sometimes I'm doing I actually do filming of of the office space, and I put put it in as a presentation, for example, like when I was doing the national ballet. They had boxes and boxes and cubicles. And I just took a short video but because people don't even see it. When you come there every day, you don't even right. see it anymore. Yeah. So start with a, just a view as a, as a first time. Do I feel welcome? Do I know why we do what we do? Mm. Um, is there any reflection of what we do? Like what change, what, what, is, what change do we do in the world? Yeah, right. You can see it there. <laughs> yeah. No, it's really <laughs> about um yeah, just opening your eyes and, and listen and see what's going on around you. Uh -huh. Yep. It's a it's a, a big departure from my first office, which was a oh, temporary office where I sat at the three point line of an elementary school gym uh, in oh, a yeah? cubicle. <laughs> Would you no back to everything? <laughs> yeah would you back to everything that was going on around you right often that's that's what happens um you know like the cubicles like yeah people are sitting with it like i i'm like against cubicles i, I don't do that. <laughs> just, no, no like because they segregate us it's the opposite of building community and collaboration one would think Rob, you worked in a whole bunch of factories in your lifetime. What's the environment like that for all of these people who are working so damn hard on the factory line? Yeah, it's funny, right? Like a lot of those places, they're they're dirty. And it's not that there's not a potential to make them cleaner. It's just that gets fallen down the list of priorities, priorities because it's not seen as a value add. Um, of course some of the factories that are producing like cars and um, things that need precision, they clean. But mm -hmm. when I was in a, a coal mine plant, it was literally like, I always describe it just like the chimney sweep in uh, <laughs> uh, what's the like Christmas story or whatever. <laughs> oh, but I, Mary Poppins, he's got the chimney sweep thing going on. Is that the movie you're thinking of? Uh, yeah, it's, it's something like that. Like the people who work there, Polar like, really like yeah, yeah. black everywhere, yeah. except for their teeth and their eyes. And like you would take a shower at the end of the day and dirt would be coming out of your hair, your nose, your ears. <laughs> it's just everywhere. And yeah, I mean, it. it's it's tough if you're working in an environment like that to, yeah, it's just, it feels unclean and it feels like you don't want to be there. And it spirals a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It affects the mental health for sure. Meta, I know you worked on a factory or in a factory. Yeah. You have a case study from, from your experience turning that ship around. Do you want to share that with our audience? Yeah. Yeah. It was actually, it was super, uh, I'm so happy that I got to do something that was so lot like the tech and, um, and I'm getting more of those now, but, um, so it was a plant. It's actually quite some time ago. Um, and they had about 400 employees and about 300 of those um, were in uh, the plant working. And uh, they have a, what I call a modern leader is Scott Barrett. And I'm like, he's super, like, his name is Dan Scott. And um, he, at the time were merging like five different locations into one large location. And I got in uh, fairly early in the process and uh, just to sort of help, help out with how they could make it more nice for everyone, all the employees. 
Uh, he's a very hands-on kind of guy. And what the what we could do because there was labs where had, everything has to be clean, but then the factory, the plants themselves, there's typically no windows in even where they work. But what we could do is actually create nice space for them to have their breaks. Um, so this was typical. The plan was um, in this facility was to just kind of inherit the, the the canteen that was there before, but we got them to break the thick thick walls and put in windows. Uh, we put in, and it's also and it's it's on my website. It's it's a fantastic uh, place. But we we really thought about the people having their break. There was an outdoor facility that could go. We put in like we decor. We made a, a decor in this space. We put in really nice lighting, uh, made it inspiring to sit and have your break. You could, and there was a place you could check your your, your messages and whatever. Like so, it was just a break space, a healthy break space, and you don't see that very often. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't have to be like a tech company doing this. Um, it, it it goes everywhere, and you could just tell people are happy they're happier because they're pre- being appreciated i'd like yeah. to see it spread to hospitals and schools oh, because those are two of the <laughs> the facilities i see in the modern day world that, that still are lost in the damn sauce like i know for as somebody who spent time with my Crohn's in hospitals i it wasn't a healing space for me i couldn't wait to get home no. and start healing and then yeah. even when i was in school you know down away at uh, prep school and then university, the fluorescent lighting, like that was the first thing I did was turn those things off. And I don't think I turned them on all year. I couldn't study in those conditions. I'm an empath. I'm way too sensitive. Yeah. Right? No, but, but, um, but we're the still... evidence is there. Yeah. yeah. The evidence there is actually, I think it's in Brazil or uh, like, and also here, I see it all. Like there's hospitals are for healing. They're not, um, they're not for, for sickness. It's like it's, it's, and there's proven there's statistics showing like if you have biophilia, like it, it, you can see green space, mm-hmm. people heal faster. faster. It's yeah. So it's just a matter of actually as a leader, there's so much potential uh, out there. Like start reading about it, get interested in it. It's a hidden resource that can be embraced and just have a huge impact. They can start by reading your book that's going to be coming out yes. soon. Let's talk about that for a second. I know you mentioned it a few minutes ago, but tell our people about this book you're writing and the impact that you want it to have. Yeah, so it's actually been on the go for some time. <laughs> she was like, when is it coming out? Uh, and actually, it was written before the COVID um, and over the pandemic. And uh, I've actually been, I'm in the process of rewriting it because it's now even more evidence <laughs> proven what it is that I'm actually talking about. People now get it far more than just the early adapters. It's becoming uh, something like a lot more people are open to. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm uh, rewriting it and I'm just going to be some case studies, but I'm also going to go a little bit more into depth about like the, um, the lighting, the materials and the colors and just the impact that it has. Uh, and I'm super excited because I think it's it it can really change how people look at space. It's not just space. If you're paying for it anyways, like why not make it matter? Yeah. So I'm excited about that. We are too. <laughs> we have to have you back on once it finally launches. Yeah. No, I want to talk fun. about what you just said in terms of, I know you were working on it during the pandemic. You were working on something else during the pandemic. You were working on your self-leadership, weren't you? Yes. You yeah. want to talk a little yeah. bit about the connection between that inner work that you were so committed to. I can bear witness and testimony to this. Um, and yeah, just the role that that has played in helping you step out into the world now to change the world, change the way the game's being played through human-centric design. Um, yeah, what was the yeah. role that self leadership played in activating and catalyzing that for you? Yeah, so I, I've always been like, even with my staff, and I know they will always say that. Like, I'm, I work with integrity, and I like to empower my staff um, to. I'm not afraid of being, not knowing at all. I don't know at all. Uh, there's no 
hundred percent right design. Like everybody has ideas and through um, just acknowledging that more and actually sort of putting words to it, I, I can see how I can even more so get my staff empowered and, and lead from the bottom up and hear their ideas. Um, but what really also ha- happened for me was I was like a doer, 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 and trying to be everywhere at the same time. And I, I, uh, I broke my Achilles or tore my Achilles completely right when we met too, <laughs> Susan. Yep. So I think it was... <laughs> Universe no, is a, really, has a funny way yeah. of getting us down to the mat when it says it's time. You can't outrun this uh, this inner healing and growing work any longer. I saw that play out. Even Susan, she was like, oh, great. I'm like, what great? But it helped me actually restructure our company and uh, and and having far more self-care. Uh, uh, um, my calendar is a completely different thing than, what it, than it used to be. I'm not, I'm not achieving anything less. I think I achieve more. I'm moving fa- faster, forward, slower, of almost if we would call it. Um, and yeah. actually, and, and also letting staff come more to service and, and, and not, uh, like I'm letting them take, make decisions and I'm making, I'm, I'm making them feel that I trust what they do. I often say like, you know what? That's a good decision. I, I trust you can you can do this. So um, just empowering them is something I'm uh, and setting my own boundaries and helping them set their boundaries uh, because in the design world there's a lot of expectation. Set. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Client client expectation, right? Yeah, with timeline and budgets and all that stuff. So, um, and that's just, that's part of our game or our, our, our work, but, um, just really sort of, um, lead with honesty and truth, um, and integrity. Yeah. Love that. Meta. Yeah. What would you say to leaders who are on that treadmill or that hamster wheel that are just running full steam? What would you say to them? Yeah to get them maybe to take, to get off. Okay. Without having a tutorial your Achilles. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh my God. It, 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 you really have to um, like actually take the breaks, like listening to your body, listening to your body is, is, uh, um, and, and, and I, and so I'm, what I'm doing now that I didn't used to do, I'm actually putting these things into my calendar and I, I, um, and feeling I'm worth to do this. This is a meeting with myself that I need to take so I could be better at the next meeting with the client. You know, it's, it's really, um, trusting and, and think about your time. Time is the only thing that you have that you can't get back. So I think about my time so much more. How important is it that I do this versus that? And how much time do I spend on, on things? And selecting um, and appreciate and honor my time. So it's, uh, it become, time has become a, a, a huge factor in um, and setting boundaries. So you only have you and you have to do the work. Um, and looking like, I think everybody can look at the IFS and learn something to be more you i mean that's all you need to be so that that whole journey has helped me tremendously and still i mean and you're never done right it's an endless um journey Journey. yeah well said yeah meta what what would you like the legacy of all this incredibly important work that you're doing to change the way the game's being played through human-centric design practices. What yeah. would you like the legacy of that to be someday? Yeah, so I never, the whole legacy was never something I really thought of. I remember. <laughs> so, no, but I would love space to be something that leaders would embrace and take advantage of. And I love the, 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 the space that they have, their offices or, or institutions or whatever they have, it needs to get up to the sea level and it needs to be part of the business plan and and be something that not as an afterthought, um, but something that you actually make a decision about. 
how do you want it to be and have the budget for it um, to make it right uh, because it, it, it returns so, so greatly, no doubt. So I'd love to bring that to the surface or to actually have it uh, be much bigger impact than it does today. So I'd like I to be that person, a part of that journey. <laughs> I would love that. You're you're definitely a part of that journey. And Mm -hmm. for folks out there, if you want to find more about Meta, you can check out her website, meta.space. That's M-E-T-T-E dot space. That's where I have to Meta space, no dot, no dot. Meta Meta space. Just Meta space then. Dot com. We'll put it in. We'll put it in the podcast notes, Meta. Don't you worry. Oh, people will definitely know how to find you. Yeah, yeah, we'll drop awesome. that in the podcast notes. And I know Jim's listening and oh. Jim, get the case study for the factories. <laughs> um, that's got super important. Um, I've also dropped Meta's LinkedIn in the podcast notes so you can connect with her there. Is there anywhere else you would like folks to find you? And and maybe where can they maybe pre-register or noti- be notified of, about the release of the book? Uh, yeah, I... Like I don't have it set up yet, but um, I would get it set up on my my LinkedIn for sure, and on the website, it's it's been it it needs to get upgraded too with the the more recent um, jobs that we've done, the projects that we've done past the COVID time. So Perfect. we'll have you back on the show when the book launches. Don't you worry, we got way more to talk. Yeah, yep, yeah. absolutely. We can talk about this forever. <laughs> I know. Seriously. Absolutely. So yeah, so connect with Meta on LinkedIn and check out her website, metaspace.com. Folks, if you're obviously for us, hit leader, hit subscribe <laughs> to launch project on your favorite podcast platform. And then for all things one-on-one coaching, leadership development, and more, head on over to elitehowperformance.com for all of that. Susan, is there anything you'd like to leave our folks with today? I just love the through line here. We're talking about how it all starts with this consciousness that a leader is totally in control of that carries so much weight, whether that's turning on the lights in your internal environment, like Meta has described, has been the catalyst that has led to her legacy journey. Uh, or going into your office space, right? And being consciously aware of what you're actually seeing, hearing, and feeling in that space. It has the power to change everything. So I love this interview. I feel like it's really inspired our leaders out there to get conscious. And that's really where it starts for me. Yeah. How about you, buddy? Me? Oh, no, exactly (laughs) what you're saying. Like, actually look around and, um, and, and and see what you're looking at. Um, how do you feel when you walk into your space? Uh, and and make it. It would never be the same. Like things change the moment you change stuff around you, and you know it. Like when you clean up, you feel different. It's yeah. all those little things that really really matters and how you you feel mm-hmm. in the space. Yeah, it's it's amazing. And for me, I think. I want to just tie it back to where we started with Damon John and what we've noticed or what we see is as you become more self-led, you start choosing things for yourself. And this is where Meta was describing how she's booking time in her calendar for the things that she needs to perform at her best. And now she's Mm -hmm. leading her team and coaching them on the ways that they can do the same. And so it's the performance impact and the and the happiness and the well-being impact that becoming a self-led leader is leading to. And that's also mm-hmm. driving the legacy and the impact that you'll have and taking that to the next level. And so if you have yeah. that inkling feeling that, you know, you have a huge goal, but Maybe you're not taking action towards it, or maybe you feel judged by folks around you. Reach out because you're only a phone call away from making the impact you want to make. 
Everyone out there, thank you so much for listening. Meta, it was a pleasure to chat with oh, you. And I'm looking forward thank to Thank you so you. much. Yeah, and I'm looking to having you back on when the book comes Definitely. out. So we can we can talk about it more. Susan, you still brought the energy, so don't worry about that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and everybody, we'll see you all next week. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.